Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Mindlessly scrolling online. I think most of us do it. It's the equivalent of watching the white line on the highway. It just glazes the eyes over. Hey, it's time for something new and exciting. It's time for Wondrium. W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M. A streaming service that I simply cannot get enough of. In preparation for the broadcast today, and we're talking mostly about Jesus... I got into a series that actually distills all of the planet's major religions down into a single feature. It's called Cultural Literacy for Religion. Everything the well-educated person should know. And the series gets into the orthodoxies and the gods and the doctrines and the traditions and the histories, and it's just amazing stuff. One of thousands of offerings at Wondrium streaming video audio content. If you know the great courses plus, you already know Wondrium, except now it's even bigger and better. Thousands of subjects to choose from. I know you're going to love Wondrium just as much as I do. But I've got a special offer just for my listeners. It's a free trial of unlimited access. So go to my special URL, wondrium.com slash Seth. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Seth. Just think about how much you could learn in a month. Wondrium.com slash Seth. Man, I've been looking forward to this broadcast for a while. I'm going to be speaking with a former pastor. As a PhD in biblical studies, Dr. David Madison spent a lot of years behind the pulpit preaching the good word, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, before he finally came to the conclusion that it's all just a bunch of crap. And he walked away, and now he's been writing for the Debunking Christianity blog. He does a weekly column for that blog. He's written several books, including the new one called 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught and Other Reasons to Question His Words. So full disclosure, I got a message in from a buddy of mine who was the editor of the book, Tim Sledge. And Tim said, hey, we'd like you to take a peek at this thing. We think it's really something special. And so I got my hands on a copy of it and I read it in an afternoon. And what I love about it is that even from a guy like me who has done a ton of the deconstructions of the New Testament, we've talked ad nauseum about Jesus and, the, you know, Jesus and the Bible and the contradictions. And you know, come on, you and I've been down this road quite a bit. I have never, I have never seen an approach like this to the character of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. This is a unique animal. This thing is so good that I immediately responded. I think that same day, and I said, hey, guys, if you need a narrator to narrate the audiobook, are you even doing an audiobook? Because you should. If you need a narrator, I want to be a part of this thing. And so we started discussions. That has just released to audible.com. Okay, and all those links are in the description box. I'm going to read chapter 10, like the whole chapter from the book in the second half of the show. So you kind of know what we're talking about. It gets into the fact that, you know, Jesus is supposed to have returned by now. Hello? Hey, Jesus. He said he was coming back, but uh, we've had our eyes on the clouds for, I don't know, two millennia, still nothing. We're going to get into uh, Jesus' promises to his disciples, what the disciples' expectations were, what the church's expectations are in relation to the second coming, the rapture, Jesus returning to carry his children away. It's a great chapter. First, I want to talk to the author of the book himself, Dr. David Madison. So good to have you on the show, my friend. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. I love the idea of pastors who are 
now Bible critics. I mean, I know I'm biased because I came out of the faith, but real fast, give everybody the biography of David Madison, would you? Okay. Uh, Raised in a conservative Methodist home in Indiana, not fundamentalist. My parents both believed in evolution, believe it or not, but my mother was very devout. When I was a teenager, she bought, of all things, the 12-volume Interpreter's Bible, which was a product of liberal Protestant scholarship. And that, as much as anything, propelled me toward the ministry. After I got my undergraduate degree, I went on to Boston University School of Theology. Four years there, got the, at that time, they call it the Bachelor's of Sacred Theology. Then went on to work on my PhD. I always had in mind to teach Bible at the college level, but I got involved in the whole process of Methodist ordination and that required serving in churches. So nine years in the Methodist ministry in Massachusetts, serving two churches. But by the time my PhD was done in 1975, my belief in God had evaporated. So I had to do a bit of struggling. There was no such thing as a clergy project back then. I had to do a bit of struggling to re-engineer my career, but I succeeded in that and plodded along in that for a few decades and finally retired in 2014. I like the title, Bachelor of Sacred Theology. I mean, it's a little culty sounding now, <laughs> but I just picture you, you know, you got the long robe on, there's candles, perhaps some sort of chanting going I on. I, I have a bachelor in sacred theology. It just pops into my head. They've converted it since then. I think I've read it's now retroactively, all the bachelors of sacred theology are now masters of sacred theology, because it was four years of graduate study. Oh, I like that even better. You know, the master <laughs> of sacred theology. It almost sounds like a video game villain. Uh, but uh, <laughs> your story reminds me a little bit of Dan Barker's, right? He is a devout, of course, he wasn't yeah. a Methodist. He was a charismatic Pentecostal speaking in tongues kind of pastor. And he's in the pulpit. He's in the you know, behind the podium, and he's starting to think, man, this does not add up, and yet he is charged to write this <laughs> sermon every single week. What's that even look yeah. like for you? You're supposed to be serving your congregation as a minister of God. At the same time, there's a deconstruction going on. Well, it was, it got more and more stressful because I wasn't believing this stuff anymore, and yet I had to lead the weekly worship service and it got to the point where you, uh, I wanted to say to these, what do you people think you're doing? You're singing songs to the master of the universe? How does that make sense? In seminary, I got exposed to the writings of Paul Tillich. And Paul Tillich said quite grandly that God was the ground of all being. So I kind of held on to that. But if I went into the church on Sunday morning and started talking about the ground of all being, people would look at me as if they were crazy. They were showing up because of the man upstairs that they could pray to and ask favors from and sing songs to. He was their cosmic buddy. So, you know, ground of all being wouldn't work. So I was so glad to get out of there. Does the modern day, or at least the year 2021 Methodist Church, look anything like the Methodist Church that you were preaching in? I don't know. I, uh, I have very limited exposure to that. Okay. I have no exposure to that now. But I know that still... They're going through agony over the question of, um, of gay rights and welcoming homosexual pastors. I mean, back in my day in the church, they were saying, we've got to study this some more. And I still hear that. We've got to study this some more. Give me a break. It's been studied ad infinitum. Please. Is that just a stalling tactic? You know, we don't want to actually have to render a verdict? I think so. Back then it was. And still, I mean, even after I left the ministry and I was engaged in a secular profession, I worked up a series of lectures to give to churches on, is the Bible really against homosexuality? And I gave that to quite a few churches. I was able to engineer the invitations. And inevitably, there was someone in the audience who would, ha you know, stick up their hand and say, well, what about Leviticus? Men shall not lie with men. And I, I finally said to myself, why am I trying to convince Christians to be Christians? 99% of Leviticus, this guy would not pay any attention to. But this one verse, that was the deciding factor. Or the writings of Paul. Give me a break. Paul was against marriage. Paul was against men touching women. 
And of course, he expected Jesus to be arriving on the clouds any day. But don't use these books of the Bible as standards when you don't accept them as standards yourself. I always enjoy the uh, believers that uh, they reject all of this stuff in the Old Testament. You know, the the banning of the eating of uh, lobster and shrimp and, you know, <laughs> banishing women from their towns for a week on their period and and those types mm-hmm. of rules, but they gravitate to the ones that seem to validate them. It's so frustrating. And I, so I, I gave up giving the lectures. I said, what am I doing this for? Especially since they were often, these lectures that I gave were often, they were in the sanctuary, and they might even start with a prayer and a hymn. And I had escaped that, and I wanted to stay away from it. I want to talk in just a few about your most recent book, but let's go back to 2016 and the release of 10 Tough Problems in Christian Thought and Belief, a minister-turned-atheist shows why you should ditch the faith. I don't think your title could have been any more direct. Well, at that time, I belonged to an atheist writers group here in in New York City, and I talked about the title, and it, it... it originally was 10 Tough Problems in Christian Thought and Belief, A Layperson's Guide. And the people in the atheist writers group said, no, no, that sounds too academic. You got to punch it up. So that's when I came up with that subtitle. But even though I had left the ministry, even though I was in a secular profession, these thoughts kept churning in my mind. Why in the world, how in the world do people still believe this stuff? And the number 10 is always a favorite. 10 top this, 10 top that. And so I thought, well, let's let's go with that formula. 10 tough problems in Christian thought and belief. And one of the most common responses I've had back then from atheists was only 10. And what I had to do, I had to assure people that there were far more than 10. But I separated them into these 10 buckets. And then finally, I got into serious writing on this book, maybe 2000. 10, 2011. And then when I was able to retire early in 2014, then I really went to work on on the book, and it was published in 2016. The Bible was part of my journey out. I used to read it like a love letter, and I just either skipped (laughs) over or was just unaware. Oh, we don't go over here. Leviticus was for yesterday, so I don't spend really any time there. And and I'm not too interested in Habakkuk, <laughs> you know, Titus. I'm not reading yeah. Titus. I'm going down the Roman road. I'm quoting from the Gospels. Uh, in your latest book, of course, you <laughs> talk about John 3.16, arguably the most popular verse in the Christian faith. For God so loved the world. God is a God of love. Our religion is a religion of love. This was just an accepted truth. And you look at it with the entire Bible providing context, and you don't see nearly as much love as you do wrath and jealousy and other kinds of things. Well, it's a phantom. People want it to be that way. When I posted about the book on Facebook not too long ago, one Christian woman responded, Jesus is love personified, and she added a heart, a heart emoji. And That's exactly the way the faith has been promoted by the, uh, Jesus has been promoted for centuries by the church. That's what priests and preachers want you to think. And therefore, John 3.16 became such a favorite verse, God so loved the world. But look more closely. The God of wrath has not disappeared. It's still there in the New Testament very much. John 3.16. Yes, but there are two verses later on in that chapter that talked about the wrath of God. Paul, the Apostle Paul. He was certain that God's default in motion was wrath. Thy kingdom come. Well, what did Jesus say about the kingdom coming? There would be more suffering at the time of Noah. I'm interested in the good cop, bad cop version of God in the Bible, which is, you know, (laughs) the Old Testament Yahweh, he's the petty, jealous, nasty guy who wipes out cities of 500,000 and commands the execution of disobedient children and instructs how to beat your slave. But Jesus kind of perceived as this big love child, hippie, (laughs) you know, And, and so I want to pinball forward to talk about a very unpleasant Jesus, not often taught about from the pulpits, a Jesus that's supposed to have uh, already shown up by now. Well, First Thessalonians chapter 4 kind of 
kicked off the apocalyptic prophet. I mean, Paul there talks about Jesus returning on the clouds to welcome even dead Christians rising in the sky to meet him. So most Christians aren't really familiar with the concept of apocalyptus and the, the, the end, the, the revealing of the kingdom at the end. And Mark picked up on that. Mark used the theology of Paul, it would seem, in constructing his concept of Jesus. And Jesus and Mark talks at the very beginning about the kingdom of God is near. At his trial, he promises the people at his trial that they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And if you read Mark 13, it's a pretty brutal chapter about all the chaos and upheaval that will accompany the kingdom. That's a reflection, scholars think, of the brutal Jewish-Roman war that you know, ended up in 70 CE with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the end of the whole temple complex. John takes it further with the concept that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's based on the concept of animal sacrifice to please God. It's not an attractive religion. No matter how much you try to paper over it with love, 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 on the surface, that's superficial. I was always struck by the fact that God simply didn't blink forgiveness into existence. I mean, he can do everything. He creates a trillion planets. You know, I forgive you, blink. But he, all of a sudden, he has a requirement. Why would an omnipotent God be required to do anything, but somehow he requires blood to be spilled to pay for the sins of humankind? And that sets into motion the meat grinder of the crucifixion. I'm interested, too, as you speak about the gospel side by side. They didn't teach us to read the uh, first four books of the New Testament in a way where we could compare them. We would read one, and then we would go to the next and the next, and we didn't really realize that the stories in each of the Gospels are totally different. The Jesus depicted in each of the Gospels are totally different. You get into that. Yeah, I uh, I don't think I put the story in the in this book, but I often tell the parable of the four Gospel writers getting together in a bar waiting to hear from the Canon Selection Committee which gospel had been selected. And they're all sitting there having their drinks. They don't really like each other, but they're sitting there having their drinks. And they all get the text at the same time. The text says, congratulations, guys. We've accepted all four of them, and we're going to print them all together. Can you imagine the horror on their faces (laughs) when they think, wait a minute, we don't want them all together. Matthew was supposed to be Mark. Luke was supposed to supersede the other two. And John, of course, he was rebelling against all three. They didn't want them published together. Do you feel like they were competing with each other? You know, when John's gospel is written, it was written last, I believe, right after the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you think he was looking back to Mark and going, oh, come on, I can do better than this. Well, John says to Jesus, this Galilean peasant preacher, Jesus was present at creation. And so when he looked at Mark's story of this preacher showing up out of nowhere to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, John would have nothing to do with that. Jesus was the preexistent creator of everything. He didn't need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. He had a much different take on it all. I'm interested, too, Uh, that uh, Jesus before the crucifixion is he's panicking a little bit. Yeah, I forget the gospel. Is it in Mark where he's oh, yeah. like, please deliver this burden from me, please. I don't want to have to yeah, do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's not in in John at all. Jesus is totally in control of the situation. The challenge I I like to throw at Christians is, and this is in the book, read the whole gospel of Mark straight through without stopping. The author used the word immediately 41 times. He wanted the story to be absorbed at once. Read the gospel straight through, of Mark, straight through. And take a break, as most Christians aren't used to reading the Bible like that. Have a big glass of wine. Trust me, you'll need the wine. Then read the gospel of John straight through without stopping. And it's a shock. Because the Jesus character, and this is what the 12th chapter of the, of the book is about, the version of Jesus in Mark is different than the Jesus version in John. Two different theologians, two different versions of Jesus. But people don't notice this. They're trained not to notice it. It reminds me of the four conflicting versions of the virgin birth. Where was the baby Jesus born, and was there a Herod? 
uh, with the edict to kill the firstborn. I mean, if you pinball back and forth from gospel to gospel, you're really reading about four different Jesuses. Matthew and Luke constructed birth narratives that cannot be reconciled. Apologists have been trying to do it for a long time, but it doesn't work. Uh, Matthew is the only story where Mary and, and Joseph flee to Egypt, of all places, to protect the baby Jesus. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to use a verse from Hosea as predictive of Jesus. Out of Egypt I have called my son. But that very same verse says Israel is his son. But of course, Matthew took all sorts of liberties and, and applied that to Jesus. But devout scholars have tried for a long time to reconcile those two stories, and they cannot do it. And most of them now admit it. I'm talking here with Dr. David Madison. He has a Ph.D. in biblical studies, author of the new book, Ten Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught and Other Reasons to Question His Words. I've seen a lot of sort of deconstructions of the New Testament, and I've seen a lot of approaches to the Jesus story. There's something special about this book and the way that you lay it out. Anybody can play along. Yeah, and my first book four years ago was 374 pages, kind of small print. But this book is intended, you know, you can read this in one sitting, two sittings at the most. I want to get the points across. In my previous book, there was a chapter on what a friend we don't have in Jesus. And I wanted to focus on that because I kept seeing there are so many negatives about Jesus in the four Gospels. Why aren't people noticing? In the book's website, there is a chart of 292 bad, mediocre, alarming Jesus sayings, Jesus quotes. And it's one of the mysteries of the faith that Christians don't look at these and say, wait a minute, we've got the wrong holy hero here. (laughs) This doesn't work. (laughs) The wrong holy hero would have been another great book title. I'm just saying. (laughs) But you're really roasting the sacred cow. I mean, Jesus is, it's like criticizing Mother Teresa. Even the people I know who criticize Christianity, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. I just know in my heart, he lives in my heart. I mean, Jesus sort of gets a pass. People walk into church and they see Jesus on the stained glass window holding little children or holding a sheep, and they hear the music. It's great theater. The church has learned to be great theater because they're trying to get across this idea of the wonderful Jesus. And of course, from the pulpit, what they hear are feel-good sayings about Jesus. Rarely, rarely are they going to hear from the pulpit the really stinging, alarming things that Jesus is is quoted as saying. I mean, the, the priests and preachers know they're there, and they're probably just as uncomfortable with them as anybody else. They're not going to talk about them. Dr. Madison, do you have any thoughts on the rampant Bible illiteracy among Christians? Yeah, I mean, the Gideons had given away two billion, that's with a B, two billion Bibles since they started it back in the early last century. It's right there on the hotel drawer. But do people really read it? And the answer is no. Their surveys have shown that most Americans are, there was one title of one survey, Americans are fond of the Bible, but they don't read it. It's not an easy read, especially those books you mentioned, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And we all know that the letters of Paul are not easy to read. He just rambles on and on. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I I think about the book of Revelation. I mean, what a wild LSD fever dream that is, and good luck making sense of it. And then you get the apologist, and they're like, well, this is literal, this is metaphor. And we're talking about, you know, the seals and the bowls and the sulfur and the blood and the seven-headed dragon and the pregnant woman flying in the clouds. And I mean, whoa. I mean, let's say that there was a John who actually did write Revelation. He was on some kind of trip. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, he went out mushroom hunting the day he wrote that. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. David Madison, uh, you've been so generous with your time. I'm going to read a little bit from your book. It's a look at Jesus that, man, everybody needs to see. Everybody needs to take a good, hard look at who the Jesus of the New Testament really was, if he even existed, and why so much of what he taught was actually pretty awful. I will read from the book, 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught. I'll do it next. Dr. David Madison, thank you so much for talking to me today. Well, thank you so much. 
Okay, the book excerpt is next. Gonna take a quick break. Hang on. Be right back. My patrons get the broadcast early and totally commercial free. Thank you so much for becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Dr. David Madison has given me permission to read all of chapter 10 from his latest book, 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught and Other Reasons to Question His Words. Number 10. I Will Return During Your Lifetime In the oldest document in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul assured believers that their dead relatives, those who had converted to Christ, that is, would rise to meet Jesus in the air. Here's Paul's confident promise, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-17. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. This is a window into the earliest Christian thinking, at least Paul's version of it. How can these verses not be an embarrassment? Paul was confident that he would be alive for this momentous event. We who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them. The imminent arrival of Jesus was a constant theme in Paul's letters. Paul was wrong. My question to Christians, do you simply dismiss this mistaken prediction, no matter that it's in the New Testament? Do you really suppose Paul just got the timing wrong? Do you file this belief in that mental drawer marked, not worth thinking about, and if I did think about it, I would be disturbed, unsettled, and anxious? Apparently, this is what many believers do, but other Christians discount Paul's failed prediction and cherish the hope that they will see Jesus coming on the clouds. A 2010 survey showed that 41% of Americans expect Jesus will show up before 2050. Apocalypticism, what is being uncovered, revealed, is theology that dreams of the day when God will intervene in history to set things right to get even. One of its forms is messianism. That is, there will be a hero to put things right, a messiah, the messiah, who will reverse the oppression of the chosen people long under the heel of foreign empires. Thanks to Paul, apocalypticism has been planted in the New Testament well before the Gospels had been written. Two or three decades after Paul, the gospel movement, the effort to tell the story of Jesus in narrative form, was underway. And starting with Mark, Jesus was portrayed predicting his return, someday soon after his death, on the clouds. In other words, Mark dramatized Paul's theology. It's important to understand that the apocalypticism in the New Testament was not an isolated belief. In his 2014 book on the historicity of Jesus, Richard Carrier has pointed out, Palestine in the early 1st century CE was experiencing a rash of messianism. There was an evident clamoring of sects and individuals to announce that they had found the Messiah. It is therefore no oddity or accident that this is exactly when Christianity arose. It was yet another messiah cult in the midst of a fad for just such cults. David Fitzgerald has listed about a dozen other messiah candidates. These are the ones we know about. So messianism was manifested in many guises. And in the New Testament, we find that Jesus plays the leading role. There are still Christians, 41% of American Christians by that one poll, 
who have not put Jesus coming on the clouds in that file of things not worth thinking about. We are all used to the the end-of-the-world preachers who keep resetting the clock for the arrival of Jesus. But these preachers ignored the timing as specified in the text. Jesus was supposed to come back in the first century. Apocalypticism is a relic of ancient superstition. Jesus at his trial tells the high priest, You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Mark 14.62 Obviously, this text has been falsified by history. It didn't happen. But a lot of New Testament thinking got stuck here. The clouds of heaven is reminiscent of Paul's promise in 1 Thessalonians 4, cited at the beginning of this chapter. And these images show up again in the book of Acts, where we read that the disciples witnessed Jesus ascend to heaven. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus' prediction at this trial is echoed in the words of Stephen in the moments before he was martyred, Acts chapter 7, verses 55 and 56. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. These have been cherished, comforting text for Christians for a long time, but they do not stand up to careful analysis. Naive concepts of heaven, i.e., it's up there, have been eliminated by our knowledge of our biosphere and our Earth in solar orbit through space, pulsing with radiation. A comic named Scott McCleller observed on Facebook, In the course of his ascension at around 15,000 feet, Jesus began to wish he had brought a sweater. At 30,000 feet, he felt weak from lack of oxygen. By 100,000 feet, his bodily fluids were boiling away from every orifice. If he ever did return, it would be as a 50-pound lump of bone and frozen jerky. Hence, theologians have retreated to a metaphoric interpretation of these texts. It must mean something spiritual. When I was a teen, fascinated by astronomy, I asked my mother where heaven was, and she gave an answer that worked for a while. It's a state of being, a relationship with God. So, even though very pious, she also was savvy enough to know that heaven was not out there, up there, to be surveyed by telescopes and rockets. So, Stephen's vision of Jesus standing next to God needs to be taken symbolically. But it's harder to get away with a metaphorical interpretation of Jesus' prediction that those attending his trial would see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. There was a passionate belief that the Messiah would show up in person, real time in the real world, to, among other things, toss out the Romans. Surely this must qualify as a major thing Christians wish Jesus hadn't taught even those who still hope that Jesus is coming back. They have to keep coming up with excuses as to why all of the predictions about the timing of the big day made through the centuries have been wrong. This waiting and wondering game began early. In Mark, Jesus promises that he'll be coming on the clouds. When Matthew copied this text, he kept these words. But when Luke made his version, he deleted arrival on the clouds. Luke chapter 22, verses 67 through 71. They said, if you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them ask, are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Luke's gospel was written some 50 years after Christianity got underway. 
With each passing decade, it became harder to sustain the belief that Jesus would arrive any day now. It's difficult for us today to imagine how everyday people in antiquity sensed the passing of time. We monitor time with clocks and watches. We have calendars and are aware of what year it is. We know what the 60s were like or the 80s and 90s. And if not, we Google it. Did the common people in the late first century grasp that decades had passed since Jesus had died? When the uneducated heard the story of Jesus decades later, maybe they were still impressed by Jesus' prediction in Mark 14.62 that those at his trial would see him arriving on the clouds. Or maybe not. Perhaps that's why Luke deleted that part of the script. It was probably inevitable that the kingdom of God concept would be given a more spiritual nuance to escape the failure of its literal arrival. Hence, we also find this in Luke 17, 20 and 21. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For, in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. Well, that's a change, isn't it? Not quite what Mark had in mind, but also purported to be the words of Jesus. Mark 13, verses 24 through 27. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Theologians are masters of revision, to put it mildly. Let's face it, they make things up as they go along. Yes, the time did come when Christian thinkers sensed that Paul hadn't called it correctly, Jesus coming on the clouds. Maybe that wasn't going to happen after all. At the very least, it seemed long overdue. Luke 17.21 is an adjustment to rescue the kingdom. The kingdom of God is among you. Or the Greek can be translated within you. This is a feel-good saying. But what in the world did Luke mean by it? If you've heard sermons on this text, you may think you know, but where did your preacher get his or her ideas? As world history has played out in the centuries since Luke wrote his revision, there's no evidence that any kingdom of God has been set up on earth by Jesus or anyone else. And the range of behaviors, from very good to very bad, by self-professed Christians can make us wonder if a kingdom of God within is really a thing. It seems so hit or miss. Former pastor Tim Sledge has drawn attention to this based on his experience with church folks. He says, As I thought about the range of personalities and lifestyles in any congregation I served or visited, I saw a bell curve of outstanding, average, and not-so-great people not dramatically different from the pattern of any human organization. Christian faith helps some individuals become better human beings, sometimes great human beings. But across the board, the results of believing in Jesus are disappointingly inconsistent. I suspect Luke didn't think through saying that the kingdom of God is within. After all, he had an almost impossible task. He copied most of Mark's gospel, and Jesus the apocalyptic prophet is prominent there. At the very beginning of his ministry in Mark 1.15, Jesus declares, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near, or is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. The stress here is on belief in what a preacher says, in this case concerning the promised kingdom of God. Apocalyptic prophets throughout history have preached the same thing. Their version of a new world order is near and about to happen. Just believe it. Jesus urged repentance because there was about to be fundamental change. The long-promised messianic upheaval was near. Mark 1.15, cited just a moment ago, is the message of Mark's gospel. Readers who flip randomly through the four gospels may fail to note that there is little ethical teaching in Mark. 
In fact, there's little teaching at all. Tom Dykstra has quoted scholar Jesper Svartvik. Mark is remarkably uninterested in relating the teachings of Jesus. He often states that Jesus taught, but the reader seldom learns what the teaching is. To which Dykstra adds, One of the most striking features of the second gospel is that it promises to present a gospel that consists of what Jesus taught, but it never delivers on that promise. The lack of specifics is bad enough, but it gets worse. We find this later in the first chapter of Mark, Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of Mark could be subtitled, Jesus and the Demons, because its author was far more interested in positioning Jesus as a hero from the spiritual realm who would thus play a major role in the upcoming apocalypse, rather than a moral instructor. Mark presents Jesus the exorcist, who could arm-wrestle with demons and always win. Christians who have even a modest grasp of how the world works should be wary of this portrait of Jesus. If you accept Jesus as depicted in this gospel, you are well on your way to full-throttle crazy religion. In Mark 1, Jesus says that he came out to proclaim the message of the kingdom, and its immediacy is unmistakable later in Mark. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. That's Mark chapter 14, verse 25. This statement is thoroughly apocalyptic. Jesus utters these words at the Last Supper, indicating how near at hand the kingdom of God is. These writers who dabbled in apocalyptic delusion were confused about the timing of the end. In Matthew, when Jesus sends his disciples out to preach, he tells them, Matthew 10, 23, For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Luke includes this Jesus quote, But truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Surely many Christians regret Jesus taught this. Again, this is simply wrong. It didn't happen. There's more of the same. Luke chapter 12 verse 40. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. For readers in the late first century, this would have been taken as a warning to remain alert and prepared any day now. That Jesus would take his own sweet time to show up, say, another 2,000 years, would have been unthinkable. How could that have been a source of comfort or encouragement, especially since the expulsion of the Romans would have been a keenly desired result of Jesus' arrival? And then there are a few peculiar items. Matthew 19.28 Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the throne of His glory, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This sounds like a line from a fantasy novel or science fiction. The gospel writers apparently didn't check their own storylines for consistency. Surely this is a blunder. You who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones? Twelve? This would suggest that Jesus hadn't yet figured out that Judas wasn't really on the team. And here are two Jesus sayings in the same chapter of Mark that can't both be true. Mark 13.10 says, And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. This is something which would not happen for a long time. And Mark 13.30, Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. In the centuries following Jesus, we have seen missionary zeal to proclaim the Christian message to all nations, translated into colonialism and the subjugation of native peoples. 
Indeed, Mark 13.10 has led to a disaster, inciting zealots to reach all nations in order to hasten the day when the kingdom of God will be initiated. But verse 10 is hardly consistent with the promise of verse 30 that it will all happen before this generation passes away. Here's another warning, addressed to the original audience of the gospel, a warning that would not make sense with an anticipated 2,000-year wait. Such a delay would have been unimaginable, inexplicable. Mark chapter 13, verses 33 through 37. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Such texts could be labeled as theological terrorism. This is an especially loathsome aspect of Christian theology, and indeed, apologists have struggled with it for a long time. I suspect this grim theology is foreign to many Christians who are fairly well-adjusted to a modern worldview and are far more concerned to save for retirement than remaining alert for the any-day-now return of Jesus. They probably don't give much thought to it, even when they come across these texts, because they don't want to admit that Jesus was simply wrong. Apocalyptic theology is firmly embedded in the quote-unquote good news that Jesus preached. Yes, the hate-your-family verse in Luke is pretty bad, but Jesus being totally wrong about how human history would unfold is arguably worse, and we don't see any movement afoot to edit the New Testament to get rid of it. If you're a follower of Jesus, you owe it to yourself to see how far downhill New Testament theology went with the help of words attributed to Jesus himself. This wraps up our look at 10 teachings of Jesus that many, if not most, Christians wish Jesus hadn't taught. And many believers display little awareness that Jesus said these things. One reason for this is that many of the faithful neglect to read the Gospels carefully. One survey revealed that only about a third of Americans have read the whole Bible. This is hardly a surprise when there is so much available to entertain us. Sports, films, TV, etc. Then, too, great stretches of the Bible aren't easy reading. So I can't fault folks for trusting their priests and pastors to let them know what's important in the Scriptures. But chances are the clergy know these embarrassing Jesus quotes all too well and see little need to mention them from the pulpit, or perhaps just aren't comfortable talking about them. The clergy know another troubling fact. At least many of them found this out during their seminary training. Even devout Bible scholars have known for a long time and admit it that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John aren't biographies of Jesus— they don't qualify as history. So, we need to look at that problem as well. And that's from the new book by Dr. David Madison, 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught and Other Reasons to Question His Words. Book link, all the links, everything in the description box. Thanks for listening, my friends. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you back here next week. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.